Maintenant, nous avons donc un premier conférencier à entendre avant de partir faire le tour de la ville pour se détendre un peu. J'inviterai donc euh, notre conférencier de l'après-midi à venir nous parler de la murale architecturale monumentale et il est ici question de quelqu'un de grand nom, M. Richard Haas. Continued, but also then I 
uh, got to know James Rosenquist, who was a, a former student of there, about three or four years ahead of me, and he came back and wanted to make his first uh, print, and so I was the assistant in charge of making that first print with him, and during that process, he said, you know, he talked all about these big mural paintings that he used to paint across the river. And he said, why don't you come over there with me and I'll show you what it's about. And that was my first introduction, really, to this whole process of mural painting. And of course, while I was over there, I would take a lot of these papers away, you know, where they had the Coca-Cola ads and the so-on ads, and I would turn them into large collages. So my first graduating exhibition at uh, University of Wisconsin, I mean University of Minnesota, and also a small show at the Walker Art Center was these large collages that were based on the papers that I had been introduced to by James Rosenquist. This is another example. That one in particular was actually bought by the by the uh, Walker Art Center, and it's probably bolting away in one of its deep basements right now. But my interest kept migrating, and I started to become very involved in trying to capture miniature interiors and miniature exteriors, much like these dioramas that you would see in the uh, you know various colleges, or, or you would also see in any museum in Milwaukee or Chicago at that time, or even in one or two trips to New York. And so I would reproduce, for instance, the studios of artists who I admire, going back to that first artist whose work I bought in a book of, Cezanne, as you see here, and of course going back to where I worked at 19 and 20 and seeing Frank Lloyd Wright on his balcony, as you see here. Now these are three-dimensional boxes, so you actually have real light inside of a small shaped box. And uh, I was getting very involved in French art history, and I reproduced uh, Gertrude Stein's dining room and, and even painted miniatures of her collection. And the size of it can be measured if you can see. Oh, well, there it is. See that? That's a uh, lifesaver lozenge. Gives you a little idea of the scale of that. And then I was now moving to Soho in 1968, and I started looking out the window of my very large windowed studio in an old cast iron building, and I would start to try to capture in three dimensions those streets of Soho. And yes, they were very empty and forlorn in 1968, 69, and 70. Nobody was living there. I mean, there were like 100 of us artists, and that was about it. To get food, you would walk six or seven blocks, to a, a store, there was only one really decent restaurant within a few blocks, and that was the environment that I kind of knew at the time. But I was absolutely fascinated by the architecture of that area, and I was really studying it in detail and making these three-dimensional boxes, as I said. But I also started doing large drawings and etchings of these facades, and you can see here, uh, my very first one, which was the famous Flatiron, uh, not the Flatiron, the Hogwatt building, which was right on the corner by my studio. Or this building around the corner, number one Bond Street. Now these are, you know, about 30 inches high, 25 inches wide, dry points and etchings. And then I would venture uptown to study some of the more historic Beaux-Arts buildings like Grand Central Station or around the corner to the Puck Building. Now it's interesting how these buildings today are, on, are filled with nothing but high-end you know, stores and offices and uh, you know, everything under the, that you can imagine that's different from what they were like then. But I started really looking at architecture in a different way when I started to see some murals that were sort of happening on Houston Street and a few other places, very graphic geometric murals. And I said, you know, there's something I want to do that's different from that, that I want to represent the city in a different way. And there, it really was a conceptual idea that sort of began it. And I said, what if I were to take the shadows of buildings, 
like the Empire State and the Chrysler and do them one to one on these two towers that have recently appeared in lower Manhattan. And that was one of my first proposals of that type. Fortunately, I didn't do it. I don't think that would have been a great thing to have had on that bad day in 2001, to say the least. But I did a whole series all around the city. Another one was this building, which was about three blocks from my studio, and that was the tallest structure in New York for about 50 years, St. John's Church. And that was exactly where it stood. Or this one, which is the Madison Square Garden, Stanford White's Madison Square Garden, as a one-to-one -one shadow a block away from where it stood, because it was gone after 1926. And the Singer Building, which is literally about two blocks from where the World Trade stood. And that was the tallest building in New York for exactly four and a half years. You know, there's always a short life in tall buildings, even today, as you know. Most of the tallest buildings today last for three to four years, and then they're you know, displaced by another building about 100, 200 meters higher. Or this famous synagogue that was on the corner of 42nd and 5th Avenue for many years until the land got far more valuable than the synagogue could possibly afford and they just sold the land and built another one six, 26 blocks north. This one in Chicago, that building on the right, never got built. That was going to be the, the civic center of Chicago in 1907 under the famous Burnham plan. The site was exactly where the federal court uh, jail is today. So I put it, the shadow on the federal jail as a one-to-one -one displacement of that particular building. And then about a few blocks from where that was on the Chicago River was this fish cold storage building. And an architect friend challenged me to come up with something for that, which I did. And what I decided to do was to take Ledoux's and Boulet's, you know, magnificent 18th century ideas and to transform that into a sort of, you know, arcade with a waterfall spilling into the Chicago River, which is then called the longest sewer in America. But around the corner from my studio in Soho was this building. And I kept passing it along with many others and I said, you know, that building needs to be finished. And so I came up with my first outdoor mural in late 74, early 75, and really took those etchings that you saw earlier and sort of transmigrated them one to one on the facade of this building, keeping, of course, the two windows. And what you can't see is putting a cat sitting in one of the windows in the back that people would pass. Uh, the little person in the front is me staring up at it, by the way, as I looked in, what, 75? And that was it uh, a few years later. That building has had a, a rather difficult life. This is what it looked like about a year ago, still there uh, in that form. The graffiti artists managed to climb up on the roof of the building next door and add their, you know, marks to it. And as you can see, it's a very faded remnant of the, of the mural itself, as it was. But this particular one also had a little graffiti, uh, you might see it kind of, you know, in the corner there. And the Con Edison company was very disturbed by that little piece of graffiti. I mean, you, I've seen in many of the ones that Serge uh, showed me earlier that there was graffiti around town here as well. And, and of course, that usually disturbs the building owners and the civic powers, and so that has been an impetus for some projects along the way. And in this case, Con Ed said, well, we're going to have a contest. We have four artists that are going to make proposals, and we'll see which one wins. Well, I was fortunate enough to, uh, to win that contest, as it were, and, oh, what's this? <laughs> this is what I produced there. Taking a lot of the historical photographs of that very site, which is a really important site in New York's history. It's the Hex Slip. Uh, if anyone read Moby Dick, that's where the ship was parked when he went off, you know, on the whaling boat, etc. And of course, it's right in front of a rather important building, as you can see, you know, 
rising above there. And so that was sort of the main theme of that particular mural. And I created a full arcade that looked into it and saw that bridge, the Manhattan Bridge, and the Williamsburg Bridge in sequence behind. This was destroyed in 2001, by the way, not by the falling of the building, but by the fact that they had to actually go in and cut a hole about the size of that arcade in the building, put back three generators that had to be twice the size of the ones that were in there, pull the other ones out, and then they called me and said, can we redo something for this? And so I had the same crew that had worked on it initially come back, but now with a much better paint, because I, I had discovered between the time I did this mural and the replacement, a very good German paint called Kine, which is a silicate paint, a very important discovery made by accident in 1978 in Munich. And so we not only repainted it, but I could actually improve a lot of details that bothered me for about 20 years looking at it. That is one of those rare things. If you could ever get forced to go back and improve one of your own works, it's, uh, you know, then you could cover your mistakes. And yes, it's true that almost everything any artist ever does has that problem, mistakes. That you have to just live with if you're you know, looking at them and passing them every day. In Chicago in 1980, there was this building. Well, what was it? It was an SRO hotel that used to be an apartment house that was now in a district that was very up, becoming very upscale, very fast, and it was going to be turned back into apartments. But of course, those, you know, developers who owned it looked at the back and said, uh-uh, this isn't going to go. So they called me, uh, along with the architect, who was a friend of mine, and what we did is we first we zip, put brick up on all those windows. Oh, well, that changed. Okay. That's how it looked after we painted it. But the windows, as you can see, that were on the side there, I had to brick all those up to get a flat facade on the north and the south side before we could do that. But I was able to keep the hundred or so windows in the back and to just add another hundred or so windows to it to get a complete kind of facade that related to the front of the building, but changed the style of the architecture almost completely. And so on the south facade, you had this rising uh, series of windows with a reflection of the building that is actually seen. I'm not doing well this. Wherever it is. That's the, that's the Board of Trade building, and if you went down about a mile down that street, LaSalle, you would see that. But below that, you also see the um, Grand Arch, about one half scale of what Louis Sullivan did for the World's Fair of 1893 with the transportation building. So it was reproducing that. Then at the top, this was taken from some of the banks he did in, in Iowa and Minnesota in the early 1920s. So it was really a conglomeration of sort of Louis Sullivan style. Louis Sullivan was, of course, I think, Chicago's most important architect for many, many generations. His uh, assistant managed to do rather well later, his name was Frank Lloyd Wright, but he was really the impetus for all of that, you know, that happened there. And so I was really doing a lot to honor him and other Chicago architects. The north side's a little different, but it's another echo of Louis Sullivan, along with a, another piece that you can kind of see there very vaguely. That is a uh, losing submission for the Chicago Tribune Tower in 1922 done by Adolph Luce when he wanted to do it as a 30-story Doric column. Every architect who ever studies architecture just oohs and ahs over that submission by Adolph Luce, so I thought, well, I'll put that in there as well. So that was a rather interesting project. The first time I could really take a building and wrap it three-dimensionally on four sides. And as I said, to keep the color and sort of lines of the front of the building, because that was the only finished part of the building in the 1920s. 
You know, they thought the building would be surrounded by other buildings, and why bother spending any money on the rest of it? This one had a side that was also needed, that needed to be filled in with about 50 windows. But here in Cincinnati, a building which used to be a Knights of Pythias, I believe, headquarters, was next door to the Kroger Companies, uh, which is the largest chain of supermarkets in America, I think, the Kroger Company. And they had this as a back office. So they said, well, do something with this north facade since it faces a large part of Cincinnati. And the idea that I came up with was a sort of homage to Cincinnati. Who was he? He was a Roman general in 540 BC, or no, 519 BC to 489. And he uh, was the one who saved Rome in the early years a farmer who came in, became a Roman general, saved Rome, and then retreated back to the farm and was never heard from afterwards. Who admired him? George Washington. George Washington thought he was the greatest hero of all time. Why? Because that's who he wanted to emulate. He wanted to be a farmer who transformed into a general, saved and or created America, and then retreated back to the farm. That was his idea. And he started the Society of the Cincinnatus on the very year that this town out in the middle of the wilderness started, and they called it Cincinnati. And so I thought that the town needed to get another connection to its history. And most people had no idea who Cincinnatus was or any of this, that the people who lived in Cincinnati. And so this was, you know, adding something to their own history. Now this mural is being restored next year, apparently, because it's kind of faded and uh, there's some discussion by the same company that commissioned it, the Kroger Company, to uh, restore it as it's become kind of a landmark in that city. Another city that had a very interesting building is St. Louis. Now that was the largest shoe warehouse in America in 1982. There's, you know, Somebody told me 12 million pairs of shoes could be held in there at any time. And the Edison brothers were the company that asked me to look at the building. They were in the process of trying to do some energy saving in the windows, so they said they could cover up certain windows and, you know, put in new ones. And I, I basically negotiated window filling. That was my job. How many windows can I get from you guys? I said, I want 400 windows. They said, you can't have it. I said, well, how about 300? Well, maybe. No. We ended up with 200 windows being covered up so that I could get this on four sides. And so it transformed into a, an entirely different building. At, at, you know. And you can get some idea here of the scale of it if you look and see the painters working away there on that, sculpt, on that statue, which is about you know 40 feet in height and that's the statue of St. Louis that I stole from the St. Louis Art Museum and put there and then on the other side a much larger statue was repainted that's about 150 feet all told in height on that side of the building and you can see them working on there as well There are some little details that you kind of encounter as you go around the building, such as this one as well. And this building, they were going to tear down in 1996 because they thought it would make a great parking lot. And then somebody came along and said, if you give me a tax write-off, I'll take this building and transform it into something useful. And they gave him the write-off. He, he turned the building into a Sheraton Hotel on one side and condominiums on the other, and he said he would save the mural. And that's what's happened there. And apparently it's doing very well today. They, they just did a television special on it about a week ago. So I know it's still there. In Milwaukee, where I'm from, as I said, and where I once worked in the mailing shoe store, Right there, that was a mailing shoe store. I, my first job at 17 was selling women's shoes. My last job as a salesman was selling women's shoes at mailing shoe store. 
I lasted three months and they fired me. But I had a certain identity with that wall above it, you know, because we used to go to movies there a lot, and that was the Warner Theater. So uh, the person who was redoing parts of downtown Milwaukee said, is there anything I could do with that mural? Well, okay. What I thought we could do is transform it into a great kind of arcaded window that reflected back to a building that I knew as a child that had been destroyed. And that was the theme of, of this particular mural. So that's the Paps building here with the gimbals on the left and then behind there was a railroad station tower. All of that is gone. And I wanted to bring back the reflection as memory, as I called it, of downtown Milwaukee as I knew it. With a lot of art deco, you know, surrounding detail. When I went to Portland, as an, uh, an invitation from the head of the Oregon Historical Society, he showed me a building that had four bad sides and two good ones. They had, the Oregon Historical Society had just bought this building and were going to expand their historical museum into the bottom of it and then sell off the rest of it as condominiums. They said, you know, they did it at the Museum of Modern Art, so why can't we do that? So that was their idea. Uh, but they needed some work to happen in, on the building itself. And so I came to them and we decided to try to do something about the history of Oregon, of course. So it started with this side, where we have the Oregon Trail on one side, and on the other side, uh, Jacob Asker trading furs with the Native Americans, which was the first business that happened in that area. And we finished off the other, the rest of the side there. That's Jacob, uh, presumably doing some business. And then on the other side of detail was you see the Oregon Trail. And you can see some of the painted detail around it. I had one guy who had to do all the brickwork. He painted, he said he painted 32,000 bricks. I think he counted something like that. He was not happy. But anyway, <laughs> and that's the front of the building, I call it the front anyway, it goes around the other side. So you see, if you move from, oops, well, if you move from this side where the other mural was, and you've got these two painted sides, then you come to this area, which is where you enter the museum underneath that, and you have an indent here, which was the stairway area. So that kind of created the theme of this particular mural. And of course, you know, the other great story is Lewis and Clark. And so I decided to do Meriwether Lewis on one side. Where is he? He's there something. Okay. And then Captain Clark on the other. Meriwether Lewis has Takachuia beneath him because she was the person who guided them through the wilderness. And Captain Clark has his faithful slave Rourke and their dog, and Rourke's dog, on the other side. I chose Rourke after having gotten rid of Mr. Toussaint, who was supposedly the husband of Sacagawea, because the head of the Oregon Historical Society, you don't want to do Toussaint, he said. He was a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> and you ought to do Rourke. He was, he was the guy who really saved this project, along with Sacagawea. Without those two, they would have never made it. So that's how we sometimes get to a theme, is the expert steps in and helps you in very critical ways. And there's another detail at the top, and seeing how you try to fold all those elements together architecturally. And another detail of Captain Clark and his faithful uh, slave Rourke, who by the way he sold two years after he got back to Louisiana which is not a very good story. This is in Philadelphia, and that was another uh, two walls that were shown to me. And this is before the great Philadelphia painting projects, of, you know, which we now have in Philadelphia, over 500 and some murals painted under Jane Golden and her group, the Murals, Mural Arts uh, Society. But this preceded all that. 
And so when I got to this one, I, you know, I knew I had a tremendous city with a tremendous history to deal with and a rather interesting site. And so what I wanted to do was to take that corner and kind of meld it in two directions. And on one side, show the sculpture at the top of City Hall, which is a 42-foot high version of William Penn done by Alexander Calder's grandfather, Sterling Calder. And on the other side, a view that sees the uh, old railroad station that stood on this site by Frank Furness, underneath which you will see two, the Skullkill River and uh, some skull, what are they called? Roars. Uh, which were representations like Thomas Aiken's paintings, if anyone knows those. So it was like a three-part story. There's the rower, one of the two rowers. This was just redone last year because it had faded after 30 years, and now it's freshly painted, repainted again. And this one in Fort, in Fort Worth was done, oh, a few years after that, and it's kind of in the absolute center of the, the renewed downtown Fort Worth. And of course, it was the Chisholm Trail, which ran through downtown Fort Worth in the late 1860s, showing behind it the original courthouse done in faux, uh, like ceramic tile. And the, the cows in the foreground are kind of emerging out of that wall. And then the two Indian stanchions, of course, are as if they were light objects on either side. But this is what happened to this mural, which is a rather interesting story. They spent, first they were going to tear it down because they wanted to fill in the block with the building. The city was very upset by that. A lot of people got very attached to this mural, so they decided instead to make it the center of Fort Worth, which is a better solution from my point of view and tearing it down. And they put about $100 million in front of it in a, a park with dancing waters, two buildings facing each other, uh, a bandstand on the other side, and the works, as they say. And so now it's apparently where everything that's happened civically in the city happens in front of that mural. And you can see the kids are having a great time. And I haven't been back to see it in its full glory, but I hope to get there soon. About 10 blocks away from that is the National Cowgirl Museum and Hall of Fame. And another mural was done somewhat after that first one, but in that manner. And here you have all these sort of charging uh, women on horses. Uh, each of them, and this is a kind of a funny story, I, you know, when I wanted to get subject for this, the various uh, heads of the board of that particular museum had their own private horse, and each of them wanted to represent their horse in the mural. So I had to do a photo shoot like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> and of course, there was much more discussion about how the horses look than how they looked. It was one of the strangest and more interesting kind of photo shoots for doing mural work that I've ever seen. Possibly the ugliest building in Phoenix when I saw it. Uh, it's called a tilt-up building. Now, what a tilt-up building is, is you lay it out in the sand and then you tilt it up and it becomes a building. So like, you know, when you do your Christmas cookies, you can shape the Christmas cookies by how you cut them out. You can shape the shapes of the, these facades also. And so I did the design before they tilted up the building and I was allowed to do some changes, you see. So that's how we got little changes in that facade. Most of the other stuff had to be where it was. So this is what we managed to get out of that tilt up. And it became kind of a full neo-Romanesque uh, firehouse because this was not a firehouse, but a firehouse supply company at the time. And so it became the ideal solution to what it should be. And it had wonderful little details because, you know, you're in the desert, you make these little rocks. We dragged in some rocks from the area and then painted the rocks behind it, etc. 
And of course we had a fire engine, as Serge had as well, and it had to be a vintage fire engine, and of course it had to be a vintage fire engine from Phoenix, and when we dedicated this mural, we had the fire department there, the locals band, you know, twirlers, skydivers, <laughs> it was pretty unreal. I came in by helicopter with the mayor, uh, <laughs> and uh, he got reelected. <laughs> Here we are in uh, Pittsburgh, which is, you know, another interesting city. And this is the back of what was then the Fulton Theater. Now all those windows, of, I said, have to go. Well, no, no, we can't get rid of the ones down here. That's my office. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So the head of the theater, which is, you know, these, uh, civic, these had to stay. I can get rid of everything else, but they had to stay. I said, that's rather bad because that's the middle of my canvas that you're trying to poke holes in here. Well, what I ended up with is this. I made it into a stage. It became a stage play about steel mills, which is Pittsburgh. And of course, the office of the uh, steel mill director is those windows, which you can see in the middle. And that's how they managed to be incorporated in that particular stage. That's still there and doing fine, uh, people tell me. And it's opposite where the Andy Warhol Museum is now, on the other side of the river. We live in Yonkers, which is about 100 yards north of the Bronx, a small city of 210,000 people, fourth largest city in New York State, uh, but a city that's like your city lost much of its downtown to, you know, big, beautiful, old, empty buildings. And they are starting a renewal project now over almost a 20-year period, and about 18 years ago, I was brought in to look at four empty walls in the sort of old center of the city, and that's where uh, I came up with a theme that was a, I call it a three-part theme. Uh, on the left, you see the nymphaeum, you know, with the grotto-like effect. That was the prehistory. That was the Native American tribes that lived in the Yonkers area, and each of them is named. And then there's also a, a sort of sculptural frieze of to a Native uh, American teaching his son how to use a bow and arrow, then the water coming down, etc. And to the right of that, over here, I think I showed that one, yes, over here is what I call the Dutch mural. The Dutch mural is because, of course, that was the Dutch city for the first part of its life, and Philipsy family was a very important family in that era. And of course, the building was sort of taken from City Hall, which is about 300 yards in front of this space. The door that's slightly ajar has a guy peeking out in a tuxedo, and as in, since it's the Dutch mural, I had Dutch Schultz peeking out. Who was Dutch Schultz? Well, he was a mafia guy who made beer in the 20s. And of course, the brewery was right on the street underneath here. So I had to kind of incorporate a little of that part of you know, Yonkers history. And the fact that he's coming out of City Hall is a very logical thing if you know the history of Yonkers or the history of any city of its type. <laughs> and of course, the two Dutch murals are about the early discovery of, with the half moon by Henry Hudson on the left and on the right, some Indians trading with the uh, Dutch in the first commerce, in other words. On the other side, across the street, you have the English mural and the American mural. The English on the left shows the early church that's still there in part, and the Philipsy Hall, which is also still there, as the two most historic objects in the city of Yonkers. And then to the right of that is a building that is no longer there called the Hollywood Hotel with the Eichmeyer streetcar in front of it which ran down the main street. So it was incorporating a series of, you know, his historic elements. And of course the, the structure, three quarters of what you see is not there. It's all paint. Huntsville, Texas. This is a wonderful little town down in, not little, it's 40,000 people, but it's about 40 miles north of, of uh, Houston. 
And this particular town asked me to deal with their main square. In, in Texas squares are, you know, courthouse squares are pretty important to that culture. And so it had lost a lot of its charm. And, you know, the building you see up above, for instance, that's how it looked when I got there. And what you see in the middle and down below is how we added physically to the character of the buildings in the downtown area. area. So that building that you see now with all of its porches is what we actually added to those and gave it more character. And then even the old, uh, you know, dime store, we added some kind of Art Deco qualities to it because Art Deco was very popular in small town Texas. And then around the corner, we did a kind of uh, homage to Sam Houston because he's buried about three blocks to the right of this mural. He lived there. And so I gave a little bit of his history in the three-part uh, mural there. And then around another corner is the town theater, and so we had to embellish that. And of course, there's a, another part of that history. Dana Andrews, who was a very famous movie star in the 40s, he was born two blocks from this. So he becomes part of their history as well. And then a few blocks from there is the Avon Theater, which was not there. I mean, it was there, and then it went away, and then we put it back. But I don't show, unfortunately, no, is uh, just to the right of that, I have uh, a, uh, a very famous uh, musician. Uh, what's his name, Captain? Lead Belly, of course. Lead Belly lived three blocks behind this building, so I did an homage to Lead Belly. Why did he live three blocks? Because he was in the state prison. Lead Belly was in for murder, too. And. <laughs> He, uh, he was released by the governor because, you know, he was Lead Belly and he had the greatest, the greatest singer in America. How could they keep him in jail after all? So when I put it up, actually while we were painting it, several uh, local Texans stopped and said, what are you putting that criminal on our wall for, son? You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> well, I had to quickly, you know, go into a, a lot of discourse <laughs> about why I thought he belonged there. Uh, but I had a lot of locals who defended the fact that he should be there, and he's still there today, so it's all right. This is Homewood, Illinois, a town I've visited now for the last five years and have done 15 murals in this town. Uh, we're going to finish the 15th one this fall, by the way. This theater was done, however, in 1983. It was torn down about 10 years ago, and that's why they brought me back to the city because they were so nostalgic to keep their wonderful home with theater mural back that they wanted it replaced. And so on the site, we did a replacement on a very different wall, but that continued a process that's been going on now for many years. And for instance, around the corner is a uh, bicycle shop where we did a mural about the history of bicycles. About two blocks from there is this railroad yard because it tells the history of a railroad yard that actually exists about a mile behind this building and so on. I'm not showing more of those but there are, as I said, 15 of them in that city alone. In, in Brooklyn, there was an interior courtyard of a building that used to be the headquarters for the school board but Giuliani didn't like the school board so he fired them, <laughs> moved the building and sold it and now it's uh, condominiums. And the person who did the job is a person I've worked with on other occasions, and he said, you got to help my courtyard, it's a mess. So I put in the courtyard this particular treatment, and it's actually stolen from another uh, building that was in uh, Brooklyn at the time, a, a bank that uh, was done by Stanford White. On 83rd Street in Upper Manhattan on York, there was this building, and it was a, a very minor thing, but it was opposite a 50-story building that was being built by a developer who I had worked with on another project much earlier, and he said, you gotta help me. I've got this building going up, and I've got graffiti on the wall opposite. I don't know what to do with it. So I said, okay, well, there isn't much I can do, but maybe something can happen on the right. And so we did this which we now call the Glockenspiel for Yorkville. 
And of course, Yorkville was the German district, and that made perfect sense to do a glockenspiel. And of course, they had, instead of, you know, like in Munich, where you have the little guys coming out, you had New York cops going in and out. And then below, since there was a dry cleaner, we had to fill that in as well. And there was a nursery school next door, so we had to give them something to see when they walked by. So that was why that got added. Here we're closer to uh, the Midwest. That's Black Hawk back in Rock Island where he lived. Yeah. <laughs> and in New York, the jail, known the tombs, I, this was probably a project that got me in more trouble than all the other projects I ever did because on one end, you see where there's a blank down the, the way there? Sorry. How about that? That blank is because I painted in a mural that everybody, especially in the Hispanic community, said, you are defaming us. I said, why? And they said, you've got the word bodega, and there's a, a vagrant lying right under it, and there's a prostitute coming across the street. Neither of which I knew, by the way, when I painted it. But that's how they saw it. So I had to deal with it. And so I came back, they said, you can repaint it if, you know, we have another committee that'll prove it. So I put back this mural in that site, which was a more positive statement about the Hispanic community. I put Tito Puente on the right. He was still alive then. He said, fine, put me in. I, or in other words, he said, I'm in. And I put uh, Roberto Clemente above him. And then over to the left, in the lower part, I put my son, who hadn't been born when I did the first mural, because he looks very Hispanic, and he so now has a little bit of an honor of being part of the downtown Manhattan murals. And then to the right, there was a thing that crossed the street, we call it the, the Bridge of Size, like the one you see over there in Venice. And so I put four three-dimensional sculptures about the judgment of, Par of judgment of Solomon on one side and the judgment of Pao Kung on the other, which I don't show here. And those are repeated on both sides. And so they complete the story of this particular mural. A friend of mine made these sculptures for me after I did small models. And uh, they're done in, in outdoor cement material. And then we painted them and they you know, become very much a part of that particular structure. I've also worked in mosaic on four occasions, and this is one in uh, Forest Hills, New York. It's a medium I love, but it's very hard to get people to commit to it. And this one represents, you know, the famous Forest Hills area. And then I'm going to do a short version of interiors. 55 to 60 percent of the work I've done has been inside, and people don't see those in the same way as the exteriors, but they're a very important part of my history, because it started with my loft in Soho in 1973 uh, or 74. When somebody broke into my loft, they broke a hole in, I said I'm going to put a door there. So I painted a door on one side and painted a balcony on the other so I could see the rest of Soho. And I also put in a fake fireplace and, you know, kept embellishing it. And that led to another mirror, another structure down the street by an architect who I knew. And we got a little more elaborate with him. We did a floor, a fake marble floor. We got fake marble columns. And, you know, we kind of recreated the whole interior. And by some chance, a new magazine was starting called, you know, Architectural Digest. And they looked at it and said, no, oh, that'd make a nice cover. <laughs> Well, the rest is history, as they say. There was a uh, hotel in Cambridge, Mass, where an architect that I knew was finding himself in trouble with the big empty square in his atrium. And he said, you know, I don't know what to do with that. I had to put in special bathrooms, and I've got this awful looking object. So I proposed this putting in of the Condoro in, in Venice as a way of filling it in. And it's, you know, a way of having finished off that particular piece. And it was really the first large interior that I did. But when the Smithsonian put an underground museum behind their original building, I was called in for a, a more elaborate kind of project. And this one shows, as you look down this alley, 
the old Smithsonian building on the upper left, and then and you, as you look through this ruinous kind of uh, Roman excavated area, you see the old Centennial building. Now both of those are exactly on the sites where I painted them, if you looked above. And a small lobby in Chicago where an architect, the same one who I did that first project in Chicago with, wanted an, a more elaborate entrance to his building, so we took the uh, church of San Miniato in, in uh, Florence and kind of shrunk it into his space. But we enlarged uh, this one, and that's an, a, a courtyard in uh, a large building in Boston where we did the ceiling, six walls, and this one wall which was sort of open where you could actually see a, a conservatory-like building with painted plants and, and trees, and then we put real trees in front of it where the water comes down, we have a real scupper with real water coming down into the fountain. It's a way of t working closely with the architect to actually make the piece much more melded together as one. And that worked in this case as well, which was in Los Angeles, where I, again I worked with the architect to have him shape the lobby to a certain extent so we could make it a more complete kind of interior. And uh, even though I wasn't too happy with the marble he put in the bottom area, I had to work with it anyway, uh, but I did get him to change a lot in the upper portion to get that area to work together, and then created a three-sided mural about uh, the houses of Los Angeles, because it was a home savings company. And so we did a whole history of houses in Los Angeles. And that's what you see at the ceiling, of course, looking straight up. And then you look to the side and you have this area where you have the great barber that walks all the way around it. The New York Public Library had a room that was not painted in 1914 because of uh, the war starting, WW1. And uh, it was empty until 1982 when uh, I was asked to come back to look at this, this building or this room. Uh, the uh, artist who they had hired, who was a WPA artist, had just died, and so they needed an, a replacement artist. It's one of those incidents when, although the death was very sad, it did offer an opportunity to, for a project. So I decided to do 14 murals in that room, and each of them was about the history of periodical publishing in New York, because it was the periodical room. And that history took me through the whole history of New York architecture <coughs> as you went around the room. And it features, of course, the Times Building and the, and the biggest one, which was there for many, many years. And there's a sub-story to that I'll get to in a second. But that has been not only saved, it's been restored recently. It's in great shape. And then I did another library more recently, and that's in Nashville, Tennessee, where as you get to the top and look in, this is a Robert A.M. Stern building, there are eight murals that were done that tell the history of Nashville. Uh, on the back side, you have aerial views of four different periods in that history, from 1880 to 2000, and then on either side, early maps of the, of the city and you have little details and vignettes around each of those maps. And of course, I studied those, or I got the idea for those when I was in the Vatican, walking through the Vatican, that is. <laughs> and I saw those, you know, that wonderful map room when you're heading down to go and see that famous ceiling there by somebody? Uh, and I said, these are great, you know, these haven't been seen enough. And so that was the inspiration for those maps. That guy walking in there is my son, by the way. Not looking for a book. And here in Kansas City, uh, another, it's a federal courthouse. What are you going to do with a federal courthouse? People are only going in and out of there when they're going to go to jail. Well, they had, it had an interesting history, and I learned a lot about it. So I thought I would, on either side, create these full ceramic vistas that told the story of how the settlers 
displaced the Native Americans on that very important site where the uh, Missouri River heads toward the Mississippi. And that's how it got done on both sides. It's too complicated a story to tell the whole thing today, but it, uh, it was really, uh, you know, a, a lot of words about a lot of different things that happened. And words always get you in trouble, by the way. And not the images, the words. Why do the words get you in trouble? Well, because the people looking at it are usually visually blind, but they are very good at reading. And so <laughs> what they did is they focused more on the words than on the visuals. And one of them was Robert Dole, because they were going to name the building after him. And he was saying, you've got a Nebraska author in a Kansas building. You can't do that. And so he said, well, but it's Willa Cather, the greatest writer of, you know, the history of the Nebraska. <laughs> well, she was a Nebraska. Okay. Uh, I said, if you can find a... Kansas woman that says what she says as well as she says it, and that she says it well, then I'll be happy to do it. Well, he couldn't find anyone, so she stayed, okay? But that was one of those battles he had to win the hard way. <laughs> this is in uh, uh, Pasadena. There are two buildings facing each other. One is called the Rose Lobby, and they're exactly the same, except they're different buildings. The Rose Lobby and the Citrus Lobby. That's, this is the Rose Lobby. That's the Citrus Lobby. They face each other. Two, you know, two themes that relate to that area. I like the Citrus Lobby better for some reason. And it has these two details in it that I like especially. And of course, it's over spilling with its citrus. Of course, they don't do anything about citrus there anymore, but it did have an important history there at one time. We're back to courthouses. This is a courthouse in uh, uh, Sarasota, Florida. Now it's a state or a county courthouse. Same problem, a lot of lawyers, a lot of criminals, but you still want to give them a more slightly uplifting feeling when you're going in. So, uh, you know, here I had a little three-dimensional space to work with, so I, did, I went back to my boxes and kind of did a slightly three-dimensionalized experience as you came into that courthouse. And as you can see, you know, they have lights behind them and they kind of take you in. And it softens the making sure they change these lights. But, you know, they wouldn't change these lights if I weren't here. And I said, you're my hero. You know, you're the man. I hope he doesn't retire soon. But anyway. And another series of windows. This is near where we live, up in White Plains. And it's, a, it's an interior, exterior in a museum in White Plains. And here I look through the building, through windows exactly like this, to these fake windows, which look through other fake windows throughout the other side, where you see, of course, buildings that are no longer there. You know, the usual story, as they say. But in Tampa, Florida, where they had this new building, very tall uh, and pretty cold, uh, they said, you know, what about the history of this town? And I said, well, okay, I studied it to some degree and I realized this is what that site looked like in like, you know, 1600 or 15 and 90. That's when the Spanish came the natives were on top of a shell mound, staring out at these strange boats, and is the famous story, oh, what's going to happen to them, you know? And that tell is told around the edges. They were murdered, enslaved, you know, died of disease and everything under the sun. So that was part story. And then on the other side, it's a little more interesting story for the people now, and that is the old city hall, and of course the Generals on the left are ready to go down to Cuba and win that wonderful war that I think they call it the Spanish-American War. And there's an airplane on the right. The first commercial flight in America was uh, right in front of the building on the water. So I put that in. And of course, they made cigars there for a hundred years. They don't make them anymore. So I put that in and, and a few other details. And that then became their you know, Tampa history. 
This is uh, Pennsylvania State University, which is a you know major university in America. We won't talk about its recent demise because of a certain individual, but uh, I did a three-part piece. Now all of the um, this is painted. When I did it, or actually it's printed on a computer and then painted over and then attached to the wall. These were just white walls when I found them. And there's a three-part invention telling the history of Penn State. And this is the main mural in the center, which, you know, is three-part. Now, the reason why I got in trouble, I get in trouble a lot, as you might begin to gather. The reason I got in trouble on this one is because I painted a certain individual behind Joe Paterno, right here. Joe Paterno was, you know, a legendary football coach, but he had an assistant who a few years ago, you know, got in serious trouble and is now in prison. Joe Paterno, who was, who sort of, supported him for a while, was ostracized, his statue was removed from campus, and it, you know, it just got worse and worse. But we had to paint out that other individual very quickly after that was all happening. So I had to send my assistant back to Penn State with a paintbrush and a small paint kit and paint him out in one hour. This is Bank One Ballpark in Phoenix, Arizona, where the Arizona Diamondbacks played, and I did a whole sequence as you entered this building, but this particular part was the history of sports in a rotunda. Jerry Coangelo was a very interesting guy who started the team. Uh, he said, you know, I've been to Italy and I've been to Greece, and I think that'd be kind of nice. <laughs> Do a freeze. So we did this, and I had to, you know, pose a lot of people, starting with early Greece, going all the way up to, you know, athletics uh, in, in the 20s and 30s. Oh, the guy golfing is me, by the way. Uh, I don't know why we ended up putting myself as a golfer, because I don't golf, but my brother does. But anyway, and then finally we ended up with baseball players, which is, you know, what they're all about. I did. A, I do very few private works, but I did do one in Madison, Wisconsin, which is near where I'm born. And this was this individual was staring up at it, wanted something about his home area, and so I did a elaborate kind of faux glass dome uh, that took you through Western Wisconsin. And it, you know, it, some of it even included details from of some farms that my grandfather owned. <laughs> it was very. You know, very special. But he sold it, they did, dismantled it, and they thought it was going to go away. Then a new museum was built in town, and they decided to put it back, and it's now in the Children's Museum in downtown Madison. So that was one of those successful revivals of pieces. Another private commission was a friend of ours at Stockbridge. He built this little gazebo, rotunda, interior, whatever you want to call it. And so inside I did a full Gothic revival room using the computer to reproduce a lot of this material, as you can see. And it's very happy. Now with a drum roll and some horns, I'm going to mention a few things. Murals don't last forever in many cases, and there have been many that have been lost or destroyed. I mean, I had a person who did a master's paper on my work a few years ago, and she went out and found that one out of every three works is either completely gone or in such shape that it shouldn't be. So that is the other side of the story. So these are now lost and destroyed images. We're back in Times Square where I found this in 1980. It became this. And then they tore it down and built a 50-story building. So that's gone. And what was it? It was a reduced version of the building that had been lost in front of it, the Times Tower. Or probably the greatest loss of all is this one, which is the uh, Fountain Blue Hotel in Miami Beach. That was destroyed about seven years ago when they decided to build a 40-story building on the site. This was last year, the county courthouse, Fort Worth again, 
And here I did a complete displacement of a very ugly building from the 50s, keeping the building inside. That was both good and bad because the building inside was so full of uncompromising uh, you know, material that they couldn't possibly save it. And so they said, you know, your $1 million fix, which was what the whole project cost back then, would cost $40 million to fix now if we wanted to save the building. So it went, and so that got destroyed. This one got destroyed because it's in Washington, D.C., and no more said. And it was next to where Abraham Lincoln died and across from the Ford Theater. But it was sort of an homage to him. It's called the Lincoln Building even before I got there. It was also the site of where the WPA started in that building in 1932. So it had some history for murals. This one is in uh, downtown Boston. It's one of my very favorites. And it, you know, I took those tie-ons and turned it into a building under construction that was never quite finished. Well, it's finished in a different way now. And another one in Munich, the very first one I did in Europe. And here, the street in front of it was sold by the mayor. Can I say that a second time? <laughs> yes, the street was sold by the mayor so they could build the building in front of it. And I was brought over by the mayor to tell me this. And he said, I love your building so much I had to tell you. All right. <laughs> but the neighborhood was very upset. But in the, anyway, it's still there, but it's behind the building and nobody can see it. In Madison, which was again my near neighbor hometown, this was put there because of a, it was such an important site in my own view, and it even included a rendition of Frank Lloyd Wright's Civic Center, which he was supposed to put on that site, and it was rejected by the city four times. But then, about 10, 15 years after I did this project, they decided to build the Frank Lloyd Wright Civic Center, and therefore my piece is now hidden behind the Frank Lloyd Wright building. They say with flashlights, occasionally people do tours of it, but it's not visible to the public. But this was the center part of that mural. This one went away because Montgomery Ward went away, and so it was gone, but it was one of my favorites. It was in Southern California, and it was based on the Aztecs because the whole neighborhood was Mexican, primarily, and uh, I thought that would be an appropriate one to kind of honor that particular kind of uh, culture. And here's the strangest story of all, pretty much. I did this in Phoenix, and it was very elaborate with all these, you know, an early Anasazi Indian and uh, Navajo Indian uh, symbols, including a, building, a room behind that was filled with all kinds of uh, murals. They, uh, that they call a inferior desecrator, is that the term? No, in interior de decorator came. Uh, the interior decorator came and said, oh, this is awful, it's all, it's all you know, old fashioned, we have to fix it. So this is what it looks like now. Uh, say no more. <laughs> and this one was on the property of Johnson & Johnson's and it was covering a building that was slated to be torn down 10 years after I did the mural. And I signed a contract and said, this mural will last 10 years in one day, and it did. So it went away. And then here's a more happy story. This mural was for Philip Morris's world headquarters in Manhattan, and I did the whole sub-basement with views all the way around Manhattan, as if you were at the top of the 35th floor, but you were in the sub-basement cafeteria. And so when they sold the building and moved and changed their name, they gave all the material to the New York Historical Society. Well, what were they going to do with it? They took four pieces out of a 10-piece stretch of mural, and they made it a permanent entryway into their museum in New York, taking four pieces of it. And that's how you know it was installed there. So it was a partial win. 
And, you know, one that I was rather pleased about as to how it worked out, because I didn't think it was going to work. Finally, a few hypothetical projects. I spent much of my time sitting around thinking of what am I going to do if I had the chance? And usually I don't have the chance. Some of them started with things like this, or this particular one, which was actually a building I knew in New York that I thought was rather interesting. Another building in Brooklyn. Another building in Manhattan, very near my studio, which I visited many times with ideas. <coughs> And of course, having gone to Petra, that got me pretty excited. And the church around the corner where they had this, uh, you know, presbytery of the church, and I thought the Wailing Wall might go there. <laughs> and then this one is a place we visit way too much. We park in front of there all the time, and I stare at this wall, which is the Performing Arts Center in Westchester, and I thought, well, you know, what if we put all the ideal cities of Italy in there? Anyway, and this hotel near my studio, which I always think could be opened up into something else, or this one around the corner where you could show exactly what was happening when they built the Pennsylvania Station in 1908. And finally, where I park my car every day, I stare at this wall, and I thought, it's a synagogue. Well, what if it became an ideal synagogue from Eastern Europe, you know, all destroyed? And that's it. Sorry. <laughs> offer you this book about the Eastern Townships. It's all black and white uh, pictures of our history. So maybe it gives you uh, ideas to come with Serge and made a wall somewhere. I don't know. Thank you very much. Thank you.